dads. Adventures in Collecting is about toys, but it might not be for your children. Especially if you don't like words like f or sh or asshole. Are you ready, kids? Get your parents' permission, check your mailbox, and grab your shopping cart. It's time for the Adventures in Collecting podcast. I'm Eric. And I'm Dave. Welcome, Welcome to, to Adventures, Adventures in, in Collecting, Collecting, where we talk toy news, culture, and hauls, along with our journeys as collectors. And welcome back to Adventures in Collecting. Here we are, Dave. We're here for another episode. We're back. We're here. Hello. <laughs> I love, I always love the energy. I look forward to it every other week. I, I wait for that, that just kind of like never ending source of abundant energy. Everyone, whenever we're back in public, is going to be like, you are actually more interesting than you come across. <laughs> and I'm going to be like, well, yeah, I guess, I think. There's a lot. You hide it a lot. You hide it behind the beard. That's that's where it lives. <laughs> oh, yeah. So uh, like like usual, Dave, when when we have a, a special guest, there is there's absolutely no reason to bury the lead here. Um, today we have we have Peter Gorell, better known as the artist behind Killer Bootlegs, um, and he has been at the forefront of the bootleg toy movement for quite some time now. So with with his creation, Phantom Star Killer, achieving iconic status in the toy world, we are happy to welcome Peter to the show. Peter, thank you for joining us on Adventures in Collecting. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for coming aboard. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So. Peter, before we get started, the first thing that we like to ask all of our guests, uh, it, because this is a, a show about toy collecting, um, what are you collecting right now? Well, I'm currently trying to collect the retro G.I. Joe uh, 3.75 wave, first wave, or second wave, I guess they're on already, uh, having some trouble getting them. I, they haven't shown up around here really here and there. They kind of do. Um, I don't, I don't like them necessarily because, but I, I feel like I need them as like a lifelong GI Joe fan. But so those, I guess. So, so, so you don't like them or is it, is it because they're, they're not like the O the O ring style or what's, what's the, what's the gripe with the, uh, the, the retro line? I, I wish they were, uh, o-ring or not just modern sculpts on retro packaging and called retro you know it's just to me they look like it could have been on a modern package and it could have been another toy i mean it, it is you know <laughs> yeah yeah and i think that's been kind of the 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 majority of the complaints aside from not being able to find them i mean yeah you know, here here in new jersey dave I, I know i've seen them a grand total I, i've seen snake eyes and storm shadow once on like an end cap and i don't think i've seen them since i don't i don't know I if you've like seen them I've at all seen baroness once i never saw any of the first three the lat like roadblock uh scarlet and um destro i found a case of the other day and i was super excited because I, I I watch I mean I follow you guys and watch how you go to the stores I do the same here in Illinois bouncing to different stores you know on my errands every day and I'm always looking and the only time I ever luck out is when I can catch somebody early in the morning before they've stocked the shelves and the boxes are still sealed and they have a pallet of all the boxes from Hasbro Mattel and I sit there and you know kind of pick through the boxes i've been yelled at a few times and told to get away but generally they let me will let me you know open a box and take something out and i was so excited thinking i'd finally found storm shadow and snake eyes because those are the only two i really honestly give a shit about but i cracked the box open and it was a bunch of scarlets and destros and roadblocks and i i just put them back on the shelf for somebody else honestly <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's a it's it's a cool line in in idea. Like I personally, I'm 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 into the uh, I'm starting to get into a little bit of the classified line with them, the, the the six inch figures. I just think like the kind of weapon system that they have and the way that like they can hold everything at once. Like it's they're really 
I find that really clever. But I, I do like with this retro line, at least that they're using the original artwork. And, you know, it's it's just nice to see like that kind of style of toy back on the shelves again. Yeah, I just wish they were more like the ones that I collected that are now, you know, falling apart from, I guess, O-ring rot. Yeah, you know, when I when Hasbro put out their Star Wars retro line a couple years ago and then followed it up this year with the Empire Strikes Back line, I thought that those hit the nail on the head. You know, it's, you know, that's what people want. You know, I don't think, uh, you know, a modern toy on a retro package. They've just been doing that forever. We've had so many versions of the re- of the modern versions of these toys. I, you know, it's insane. So to be able to get something and have, you know, I mean, that you're not tiptoeing around or having to put on a shelf and stare at where you can take it open, play with it, you know, or have a carded version of a figure that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get, I think is very cool. Yeah. And, and, you know, with that star Wars retro line too, the, the, the idea that they were putting out figures that never came out in that retro style were, was cool. Like the fact that you could get the, uh, the Tarkin figure that came with the board game like that. I feel like that plays to a market like very well, right? Cause you can continue the collection that you started 40 years ago. 100%. I think that they should do all of the characters from the prequels, sequels, and anything in between that they didn't have a chance to make from 77 to 85, you know? And I think, just think if there was like a Cobra commander figure from the uh, G.I. Joe movie where he's like half man, half snake, like if they put that out, how well would that do? You know? Yeah. And I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're now, now we're speaking into, you know, your wheelhouse, right? So right, right. the, 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 the retro aspect of this stuff, you know, clearly has inspired collectors all over and has inspired this entire community of, of bootleg toys. But tell us a little bit about how these retro toys really kind of inspired what you do. Okay. So I've always collected toys, you know, um, I was born in 85, so I kind of missed the Star Wars boom, but my grandma was like an avid garage sailor. So she would go to garage sales every day and pick up the toys that people who were 10 years older than me were now desperately trying to get rid of because they, you know, were starting to get hair in their armpits and wanted to talk to girls and shit. So they were done with Star Wars. But my grandma would took to collect them all kind of literally and would just get them everywhere, every garage. So she went to. And uh, so I kind of amassed this collection of figures that I really had no business playing with or having. And uh, I just kept playing with them. And then when I grew out of kind of playing with toys, I just started putting them on shelves and then getting them on in package and keeping them in package. And, you know, um, so yeah, it was kind of always action figures. It always played a big role in my life. And, um, as I got older, I, uh, when I had my daughter, she just turned 13 the other day, I was looking for kind of like a hobby to keep me busy doing something you know when I'm at home and I hadn't done art in a number of years since high school really I did a bunch of art classes in high school and was always really talented but I just lost sight of my passion for art and in this pursuit to find a hobby I started going through my action figures and finding ones that were broke or that I had doubles of or triples or quadruples of and would then you know boil and pop them and uh, take them apart and just started making kind of weird mashup toys and different characters and uh, different pop culture reference things, mashing two things together. And uh, I I started putting them in, just doing this for myself. This was kind of, so this was like before social media and I was just doing them and friends of mine would come over and see them. And, uh, say, hey, we're having, you know, or this other buddy of mine's curating this art show at this bar next week. Why don't you put some of these things in there, you know? 
So I, I started doing that around town locally and was putting these creations that I was making more one of a kind sculptures at the time um, that were made of action figures or action figure based or incorporating action figures in some way. And uh, they started selling and I would want to make another one because of I, I at the end of the day everything I make I'm making for myself this is something that I want you know a lot of times um, I'm making it because it's something that I want and I want to see made so these things I would put them in shows and then they'd sell and I'd be like gosh now I gotta remake this thing you know like <laughs> I'd have to like go find out some of these and I was using rarer and more rare figures I've always kind of done that in my work tried to use things that you know, there used to be kind of this rule back when, back in the early days of kind of bootlegging 10, 10 plus years ago, where you, if you used a part, it was kind of something that, you know, you were using and it was kind of your thing. And now it's kind of a free for all with so many guys doing it, but I digress. So I, I had to keep remaking these things that I was making. And uh, a buddy of mine told me that I could make, he was working in some factory that was doing some mold making procedure in some way of making multiples of parts small parts and uh he just kind of explained the mold making process or just molding and casting kind of injection molding or just like that whole process to me of making multiples and i started doing research online and found articles about mold making and silicone molds and resin casting and it was all in regards to other crafts and stuff and i just kind of geared that towards what i was doing and just taught myself how to make molds of everything and taught myself how to make casts and then slowly but surely started hand painting them and making the packaging and doing all the different aspects that go into making an action figure and trying to make it as good as I can, you know? Um, so in, when I started doing that, you know, I was post, social media happened of course. And I started posting these things online and they would get shared here and there and, you know, different Star Wars collecting groups and sites on Facebook and such. And I was starting to get compared to this character, the Suck Lord, the Suck Lord. That looks like the Suck Lord made it. And then I was like, what, who's this guy, you know, or what's the Suck Lord? <laughs> so I Googled that and uh, saw his stuff. And I was like, like, there's some guy who's doing the same thing as me. Like, this is pretty wild, you know? And um, so when I realized that there was another guy doing it, I wanted to do everything the opposite, complete opposite of what he was doing. So if it was going to suck and his whole at, uh, aesthetic was that it was like some back alley bootleg thing that you could find in Chinatown, like I wanted my stuff to be killer and have it be cool and the best that it can be, like the cream of the crop. And I've always strived for my stuff to be the best. And I've always tried to excel and one-up myself or one ups, you know, if some new guy comes on the scene and he's making toys, you know, that I'm gonna make something that just blows his socks out of the water and or whatever, you know, it's like it's friendly competition in some ways. And uh so yeah, I've just always kind of progressed and progressed and progressed and Star Killer at the time at 2013, that was kind of my go big or go home moment. I hadn't I've always I had always sat back at the sidelines and behind a computer screen and watched San Diego Comic-Con happen and just, you know, looked at the exclusives and tried to get them or tried to find somebody to mule it or buy it on eBay or all the stuff that, that everybody does. You know, it's like this show that you don't go to that you watch from home, you know, on, on G or on G5 or whatever the fuck that channel's called or whatever, but you don't go to San Diego Comic-Con. So I got, the opportunity from a close friend of mine now, but at the time he was a stranger and that was Dove Kellimer, the owner of DKE Toys. And he asked me to make a figure for him. He had been watching what I was doing and now he has his DKE con and it's all bootleg toys and all these guys that me and the suck Lord have inspired to make these toys, you know? And, uh, but at the time it was all vinyl designer, vinyl toys that he was selling. And, um, like it'd be like a suck it was a suck some suckler toy and some uh, skinner resin toy and then my toy and and uh i wanted to do something that i thought was you know so 
different that it would stand out, I guess. And at the time, you know, nobody was really doing hand painted figures. It was kind of like what Suckler does, casting it in a solid color and splashing it with paint or casting it in two colors and a swirl kind of like David Healy does or some of these other, um, you know, bootleg artists at the time with minimal painting and just kind of uh, playing more with the additives like glitter and glow in the dark and the colors you can get just dyeing the resin. And I was like, well, I'm going to hand paint this thing and just do something that's one up from everything that's being done or every, anything. And so I gave him, tried to put his, integrate as many bells and whistles as I could to the figure, you know, by giving him a telescoping lightsaber that was hand cast and giving him a vinyl cape that was all hand cut, you know, with this jagged pattern that made it look like it was tattered. And I collaborated with a friend of mine, Luke Yates, to do original artwork that was based on the toy that I was making. And we made this package that was, you know, not like um, photocopied pictures like Sucklord might have done at the time. It was, you know, fully printed artwork that was original. Um, it was just kind of like revolutionary, I guess, for the handmade toy scene at the time what I was doing and it has inspired a lot of what's come after I guess is why it's become so iconic I suppose or why that figure did I don't I try to think about it sometimes and why that stuck out and uh you know it's just I, I never let it go I always revisited it and made new versions of it and it was skateboards of it and t-shirts and minifigures and different toys and and now comic books and now comic books but that <laughs> At the show, it sold out before I even got there at San Diego. So I didn't even know that preview night was a thing. And I just booked my ticket for that first day, I thought, because I didn't know that I had like a vendor badge or whatever that I could just get in and uh, to that day. So I showed up the next day and they were already sold out. And yeah, uh, <laughs> and, um, yeah so it, it just was kind of like a pretty cool experience to go out there and um I, I had gone every year up until this year um, where I'd have a toy released or something. And I became friends with Brian Flynn in the process because Super 7 was always a couple boosts away from DKE. Um, and yeah, Flynn wanted to make a reaction version of it. He was always really stoked on the character and thought it was cool, you know, and um when the time was right, we put out the reaction figure in 2018. Well, I mean, it, it's one of those things where not only the design of the character, you know, with the 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 popping colors and you know the the bright oranges and greens and you know like the, the character stands out, you know, but it also kind of plays at the the nostalgic and maybe even aesthetic appeal of of like so many different things right so like you have the the iconography of the kenner star wars toys which there might not be a more famous toy than kenner star wars toys like it's just the kind of the way that it is if there is one that's more iconic maybe it's a he-man toy so you put a <laughs> you put a green skeleton face on like basically obi-wan's body yeah. it, it, like you know you are playing up to what could arguably the be the, <laughs> the most nostalgic slash iconic looking toy ever yeah so i mean it's one of those things where i i can remember you know it, so dave and i have, have only been doing this podcast we just we just celebrated our, our one year anniversary of doing it but you know we've been collecting toys for <laughs> pretty much our entire lives you know dave going back to you know being around for those return of the jedi kenner figures right dave that that was, yeah uh, yeah yeah it was definitely caught the the end of uh you know the the kenner run um <laughs> i think that that last or that first power of the force like Re return of the jedi kind of thing i i don't remember power of the force but i do definitely remember the jedi toys and um and of course yeah, he man yeah and of course he man so and especially with that kind of aesthetic that you you get from the reaction figures, which mm. is that era, um, it it felt like it was a perfect fit for you. Yeah, and, and believe me, that was all intentional, guys. <laughs> like I kind of 
took all the things that I thought were, you know, and well, actually my idea for the whole thing was, and this, it, it, what you said is all true, but I, what I did was I took kind of George Lucas's recipe for all the things that were inspirational to him and whether, you know, it was Kurosawa films and spaghetti westerns and the seven, you know, Vietnam and medieval, uh, you know, Greek mythology, medieval mythology and, and Buck Rogers and all that stuff that was influential to him as a child. And he kind of spun it all into his own yarn and made this tale Star Wars. I, I just did that with everything that was influential to me, you know, Star Wars, He-Man, Disney films, you know, uh, the Black Cauldron was a big influence on Phantom Star Killer and the character design. One of my design. favorite of all time. Yeah, I was going to say there's definitely some Horn King in there. Yeah, hundred percent. That's why when we, uh, I think the fourth colorway of him was the Horn King colorway, and that was me kind of paying tribute to the inspiration that it gave me. Yeah, and it's you know I I was fortunate to kind of have you know, Jedi being the, my, really my first kind of exposure to star Wars. Like, like I was saying, I, I wasn't power. Of the force was Eric's kind of era, but there wasn't a movie at that point. It was, we were gearing up for, uh, you know, Phantom Menace. So it's, it's cool that there was kind of like, he got to play with some of my old Kenners and it was that kind of generation gap there. Yeah, that's like, like I was saying, like a lot of the garage sale stuff that we were get, I was getting at that time, or like my friends, we'd be over to play, I'd go over to play G.I. Joe's, and um, they would have, you know, a Darth Vader case or a C-3PO case full of their older brother's figures, and we'd bust them out and, you know, have both, and it's like, I, for a while, had no idea what Star Wars was, and then, and I had, my dad showed me like a bootleg VHS tape one night after a Halloween party. And it just kind of changed everything for me. Cause then I had context to what these toys that my grandma had given me were. And these toys that I was playing with at my friend's houses and my brother's friends and they're all their older brother's toys and shit. And uh, yeah, it changed everything. And, and star Wars kind of became a big thing for me, you know, where I would, this, like before the internet, you know, where you'd have to read the character guides and all the source books and, you know, on the, all the we weapons and vehicles, and you know, I would spend hours reading that shit and all the, the, the books and stuff, the, as I got older. Man, even, even well into the, the nineties with like the, you know, the Kenner, you know, right before Hasbro power of the force, mm -hmm. you know, so like the super buff Luke Skywalker and everything, mm. um, <laughs> you know, even even in that time, like I I can remember that to to this day I only know some of the characters' names because of the back of the cards, you know, because yeah. of you know looking at the back of the figure and knowing you know what was coming in the next wave or like what was still out there. If it, if it weren't for the toys, I think like and I think many people would say the same thing. The the knowledge of you know kind of that world would would fade you know mm -hmm. without the toy line 100 percent. yeah especially like you were saying we did we didn't have internet i mean we had like our books were the marvel comics for uh the marvel star wars comics or i think uh even like we were getting dark horse at one point mm -hmm. yeah like during the shadows of the empire i love that Shadows of the Empire, I love all that. Like, yeah. that was the first game. Well, not the first game, but the first game I, like, remember sitting and, like, not leaving until I beat it, you know, in one sitting. And that game was fucking hard, too. Yeah, I love that game. I, I tried to play it on an emulator not too long ago and was like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's like, oh, games used to control like this? Ew. Mm. Or like Dark Forces. Oh, like Dark a, Forces, Rogue Squadron, all those yeah. games. I love that. It was like Doom with Star Wars. Yeah. So there, there have been many, many iterations now of uh, of, of Phantom Star Killer and and uh, and Count Draco Knuckle Duster. Yeah. Um. And this past weekend at at Virtual New York Comic Con, which we're still getting used to like this whole virtual thing it's just it's the worst but it's totally necessary mm -hmm. um 
you revealed two two more iterations. So, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned briefly before was kind of like really thinking and focusing on the, the design and the color and everything. How how do you go about deciding what these special editions of the figures are going to look like? Like, how do you land on these these incredible color patterns and, and designs? Well, the two that were released this past weekend are both original versions that I came up with years ago. So the, well, the very first, before it was even Phantom Star Killer, I think uh, the, it was in 2012 when I first made the molds that birthed the Phantom Star Killer figure, I casted it in a, a clear resin and airbrushed it, I think, like a smoky gray color with some translucent paint and painted his eyes red and gave him a red sword and a black chest box and a see-through gray cape and called him the smoked out phantom. And that was one of the first figures that I released in, well, in 2012, but it was when I had started doing toys kind of full time and was making this transition from working in a factory for barely over minimum wage to doing toys full time. And that one sold out while I was at work and kind of made up my mind for me. And, uh, so it was cool to kind of go back and, uh, you know, do a version of star killer that pays tri like tribute to that original smoked out phantom <laughs> and, uh, how far that characters come, man, you know, and knuckle duster, that was his other alternate colorway when, uh, so in 2015, I collaborated with a company called Terra of Planet X Skateboards, and they commissioned Alexis Zurit uh, to do a of Night Riders or not Night Riders? Is it Night Riders? Space Riders fame, the comic book Space Riders that's um, Black Mass Comics. Um, he did a Star Killer and Knuckle Duster skateboard for um, Terra of Planet X, and. Uh, they were like, okay, we've got one color way of him, where, which was the classic purple and yellow um, for Knuckle Duster. And he was like, come up with an alternative one. So I, I was like, all right. And I just, you know, I always look at color palettes, um, you know, and what colors go good together and what colors are eye catching. You know, that's what I did with Starkiller initially with the orange. I looked up what color is most attractive to men's eyes between ages like 18 to 35 or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I got you motherfuckers. Mentally. <laughs> well, you sure did, <laughs> but that's the truth. And then, and then I looked at what colors on the color wheels were, um, you know, uh, that complement those, that color. And that was green. And, you know, I just started playing with it from there and just made, his color palette and uh, I always kind of do certain things like that. And, uh, you know, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where it came up with knuckle dusters is another one of his like classic colorways. So I, you know, for a second version, I had to do the OG, you know, the, the second original colorway. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things that's always so interesting about these the the variants too is the the card art. So you know, especially you know with with Super Seven and the the reaction line, you know, it, it's I I open everything, um, everything. I have I have no I have nothing mint on card, but the reaction line I actually like, I I very meticulously take an exacto and cut the bubble off so that way I can keep the card nice with hopes of one day that I will have enough space to display, you know, all, all of the cards, um, cause they are gorgeous. And specifically we, we were talking about this a little bit before we, uh, we hit record this evening, but the, the art on the, the Phantom star killer with the, the like foiled, uh, you know, element to it is yeah. just the coolest. Yeah. Yeah. So beast, me and beast wreck, um, have been, he uh we worked on that together and um that was a cool process to you know figure out how to incorporate the holographic glitter foil cardstock into his artwork 
and um it just looks great with the glittery star color or star killer color <laughs> it's kind of a mouthful the <laughs> glittery star killer colorway yeah <laughs> yeah it looks great um but yeah they super seven gives me a lot of uh range to, to do whatever i want really um within the for within the realm of card art and packaging um so yeah me and uh jared had did a a b strike had did a piece for uh the s- skeleton faces and laser swords uh art show i did at toy du jour last year and he just killed it and he did such a good job and i love his style his stuff is just so so awesome and uh yeah getting the opportunity to work with beast Rec is 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 great and he's a great dude um and for knuckle dusters card um this is that's joseph schmalky my partner from the star killer comic book this is his third card back and uh yeah he killed it man he does a great job with my characters joe's always uh doing you know doing a really great job with my characters and uh he's got a lot of practice drawing them over and over from that comic book i tell you what so he could probably do them blindfolded in his sleep you know yeah the thing the thing i like about that card art too is it reminds me of like you know, it could be like one of those '80s vending machine stickers, mm-hmm. you know, with the, and I think that like it, it speaks to the the kind of nostalgia vibe of of the figure itself. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, we were definitely looking at references. I was typing in all types of weird, you know, things, you know, the products that were made back in the '80s and '90s to see how they incorporated the paper to the you know printing yeah it's it's amazing um so you mentioned the comic book um so we know that um the comic book is coming uh yeah. tell us tell us more yeah so they they're all printed and they've been getting delivered so anybody who's ordered them should be getting them any i guess day now um so yeah we uh did a Phantom Star Killer comic book with Scout Comics uh, under their Black Caravan imprint that um, my partner on the comic, Joe Schmelke, is the co-publisher with Rich Woodall. And uh, yeah, the comic turned out great. It was an awesome project. I got to stretch my wings a little bit and do some writing on the project. I wrote the whole thing and colored the whole thing and Joe drew the whole thing and uh it was a really cool process uh the way we worked on it um because i'd never written a comic before and a lot of this was kind of outlined on the card backs you know that i had written in 2013 and 2014 for knuckle duster and star killer and uh it was kind of weaving those storylines into us it that that were already established and have been established for a long time and kind of um weaving them and weaving a story into those storylines backstories i suppose and kind of dancing around within there you know and uh in the comic there's a flashback that goes through kind of a brief history of star killer the whole story of what happens on the back of the card back so every time you anybody's bought in one of the uh phantom star killers they've seen on the back of the card there's a story that uh is the same backstory i wrote in 2013 and uh that plays out over a few pages during the story and uh so i think a lot of people will like that and uh you know it kind of then jumps back into a more fast-paced kind of hack and slash comic yeah, that was going to be my, my my question about the book, because like, you know, the, the character has the, the backstory on the on the back of the card. Like that's you know, that's what we know about him. You know, did the, did you enjoy the opportunity to kind of take that story and run with it and really kind of give him, you know, a, a much a much richer tale? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I actually wrote so much that uh, that it were 
I've been breaking it up into the second comic that we're doing. Um, I'm real long winded, I suppose, in the way I write. And I was writing it actually to be kind of more descriptive and, uh, you know, describing things that you obviously couldn't, uh, sh you know, uh, show, or I guess you could show, but I was describing it to Joe. So when he was drawing it, that he could see what I was really thinking and how I was thinking and how even the room was lit. And if there was, you know, just so many details that I wrote into it and a lot of it had to be edited way down to, uh, to, to make dialogue for a comic and to make panels and everything. And, uh, so, but yeah, it was great. It was great, uh, to be able to, to, to tell the broader tale kind of, and, and just a segment of it. I mean, this is really just the beginning, guys. I mean, this uh, this comic that's coming out is just one mission that he goes on, you know. And uh, there's so m I've got a lot outlined for uh, for a lot more stuff, and and hopefully, you know, um, th hopefully that it can you know someday be um, presented in in uh, you know a different uh, multimedia format, whether it be a movie or a animated film or an animated short, animated series, you know. Do you see this character going into any other mediums? And and if there are, like, you know, it sounds like you're already planning for it, but you know, are, there, <laughs> are, there, are there any in particular like that? Because, again, like, it's just with the iconography of this character and the way that this character looks, and especially, like, now with how popular nostalgia is i mean I, I think to an extent nostalgia is always popular whether it's you know in the 80s people were nostalgic about the 50s and like now we're you know people are nostalgic about the 70s and 80s again it's just kind of like there's always that circle right and and i feel like now with the popularity of the character like now would be the time like i could totally see an adult swim show you know, where it's even even like Aqua Teen format where they're like 12 minute episodes. Right. Like I could totally see a, a Phantom Starkiller show like that. Yeah. Um, so can I. And I hope that we do someday. Um, you know, I've been. Uh, um, I've been working on. Stuff. Uh, yeah. I, you know, that's about all. I don't want to say too much. I don't want to say too little. But, you know, um, Fair. we're definitely working definitely working on stuff and uh you know i hope i hope that uh you know everybody's ready when the when the boom comes because it's coming boys oh man <laughs> <laughs> well exciting to hear speaking yeah. speaking of the boom you also had mo as if as if there weren't enough things for you to be talking about this weekend you had an additional announcement yeah <laughs> A, ch a change to your uh, your your title. You why don't you tell yeah. us a little bit about uh, what what you're doing with uh, with Scout? Okay, um, yeah. So uh, it's hard to contain myself, but uh, it was hard to contain myself for this long. But yeah, so um, yeah, Scout Comics, um, the comic company that put out Phantom Star Killer, um, is starting a toy company, like a sister company called Tracker Collectibles. It's um, going to be like the toy biz to their Marvel, whereas um, Tracker will have exclusive rights to all the IPs that Scout, Black Caravan, and Scoot currently have publishing and merchandising deals with. And producing toys, collectibles, action figures, games, all types of stuff that we've been talking about, working on. And, and you are going to be. Uh, yeah, the CEO. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess I'm in charge. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of cool. Yeah, congratulations! Thank Officially, you. congratulations! This is amazing news. Yeah, pretty crazy. Yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, and they and and Scout, you know, they have so many. They have so many IPs. So you have you have quite the sandbox to play in there. Yeah, of course. Uh, there's so many great titles from um, Metal Shark Bro, Stabity Bunny, Gut Ghost, Electric Black, The Mall, uh, Phantom Star Killer. There's quite a few. Uh, 
that we're going to have some fun making some toys, some really cool toys out of. Yeah, the 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 and I'm I'm just re, I'm actually refreshing my memory right now, scroll, scrolling through the list. There is a lot of toyetic things <laughs> that you have to play with here. So, yeah, I I'm we're we're very excited to see what what happens with that because it's it's also been a, it's been a little bit since there has been kind of like a a, a toy company directly linked to a you know a, a comic book company i mean the most recent one and unfortunately they just went under was was dc direct um you know producing toys for for you know dc comics but you know there really isn't you know that kind of relationship anymore and you know hopefully this will kind of you know spur some things to come yeah you know i think that you know that me coming from the more of the designer toy world and you know, collect, uh, you know, lower run, higher collectability um, products, you know, that this kind of lends itself to the, you know, the clientele of what Scout already has, you know, it's, you know, these are higher end comics that are, you know, lower run and not Superman, Spider-Man, you know, and that have rabid fan bases and uh, you know, all have independent fan bases and uh, popularity. So I think that, you know, to, to do some things that aren't so, uh, you know, ambitious, like let's say DC Direct would do and make 5,000 units or something, you know, or 10,000. I don't know what they were making of their toys, but they, you know, apparently were losing their ass on toys that, uh, uh, the, some of the most beloved characters so they're doing something wrong yeah you know i i think too the the thing is i, I you know some of those dc direct products were gorgeous that they were putting out i think and it, and it seems to kind of be the general consensus is that you know warner brothers you know kind of bought DC and they there was a big like shake up with you know how they were structured and everything and it, it there, there's still a lot of the DC direct product that's still up in the air like people don't know if like the stuff they've announced is even going to come out if you know it, there's there's a lot of question marks right there with that but you know to your point I th I think kind of harnessing that that indie and uh, collector culture that you know and and kind of have been operating in for so long is is huge i think that's a that's a really smart way to enter to enter into that venture yeah um and that's the way we're looking at it and you know um just want to make cool stuff for cool people of cool properties you know I th I, th I think that's I, th I think that's the way to go about it for for sure. I think you're I think you're right on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it taps into taps into the collectability for sure. So, what um what what's next? So what's next for you? So you have all of this you know this incredible stuff that you just announced. You know, yeah. you're, you're starting a new company. You have the future of Phantom Starkiller, um, you know, now that we're kind of like out of con season, you know, you, you know, virtual or, or otherwise, um, what, what's, what's the next, what's the next step for you? What, what can we expect to see next? So I'm working on the next comic book, which is going to be a Draco knuckle duster focused story. Um, and I'm also working on, and that also that Knuckle Duster comic will also be with Joseph Schmelke under Black Caravan. And um, then I'm also working on a children's book for Scoot, which is Scout's imprint for 12 or 4 to 12 year olds. So this is going to be a children's book called Little Star Killer or Lil Star Killer. <laughs> Yes. With uh, <laughs> with um, C. P. Wilson, who was an artist that also made art for the skeleton bases and laser swords, uh, Star Killer group show uh, last year, 
and he has this Winnie the Pooh meets where the wild things are style that he does. And uh, he did like 20 images of Phantom Starkiller, Draco Knuckle Duster, uh, Vice Admiral Aker, and Absolute Ruler Thuban all kind of doing these cute Winnie the Pooh type things. And uh, <laughs> so when Scout announced Scoot and uh, a, a couple weeks ago, I uh, talked with um, James Haight, the president of Scout, and uh, the creator of Stabity Bunny, Richard, who is heading up Scoot. And uh, we just all decided, yeah, it was a no-brainer to follow it up and do a children's book. Um, Because, you know, I mean, I have children. I don't know about you guys, but... A lot I, have, of the, I have a five-year-old. So. A, lo- a lot of the guys that collect my stuff and that are fans of Phantom Star Killer all have children, and I do too. And, you know, I think to have something to share with your kids and, you know, have this that you can share with your passion with them and, you know, your love for this character with your children and, you know, have something that you can bond over is a great thing. I know when the Star Wars books came out five, six years ago that were like Good Night, Little Vader, or... or uh, That's exactly what I was thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I remember getting those for my kids and reading them, and those being the books that I would gravitate towards when it came to reading time at, you know, bedtime, and all the books that I went and found uh you know at thrift stores and stuff that were all star wars or ewok books and you know these old books that i think you know my character would fit nicely into especially with uh you know cp's work man like they're just so good it it we were discussing it has it, when he did the show like it, right last year even before we knew that there was uh publishing uh that we could get for the book um we were already like we gotta figure out a way to make this a children's book you know and uh yeah so that's gonna happen that'll come out next year early next year um and that'll be um you know and be able to be bought in bookstores because uh scout just um signed a big deal with simon and schuster uh for distribution and um for books and stuff so uh yeah that's something i want to be able to people to just be able to go into barnes and nobles and buyers you know something like that and um yeah so i've got that toys uh you know uh just uh design the next figure hopefully for the reaction line um there's some more reaction stuff coming um yeah i mean i'm still gonna be doing my killer bootlegs my like independent stuff as well handmaids you know uh probably lower run kind of like what i've been doing with the reissues of star killer just like low run uh handmade stuff here and there and you know um yeah i'm gonna keep busy it's it it sure sounds like it <laughs> but you know i i love the idea of you doing a kid's book cuz you know my daughter you know loves going over the the toys with me and you know the collection and i'm actually looking at it right now i just got that um that carbon freezing chamber playset from from hasbro and uh and i actually have uh <laughs> i have phantom star killer up there with with darth vader right now i'm i'm staring at him and my my daughter is always like you know cause she watches the movies and everything with us and mm-hmm. uh, she's like who's the orange guy <laughs> i don't remember him from the movie <laughs> that's funny i'm like oh it's that's darth vader's friend from another galaxy it's just yeah. you know. and i was just thinking, like it you know good night little vader is just like just thinking of that has has me fired up for like you know gifting gifting the book because i thought Goodnight little vader was hilarious yeah yeah we have all of them 
Yeah, the, all of those, the Star Wars, and they, they've actually been doing them with the uh, some of the Marvel characters, too. Like, we have, like, a Good Night Baby Groot one that's oh, hilarious. Cool. There's one that's, like, uh, Dave, what's the one that you got for, for her? It's, like, Grow Up Ant-Man. Um, yeah, Grow Up Ant-Man. If, and it's, like, Ant-Man and his and his daughter Cassie, and, like, he he's basically playing a joke, like, how big can he grow? And it's it teaches you like big and small and it's it's adorable. But yeah, like all of those ideas, taking these characters that are, you know, meant and kind of now for a, you know, older audience, making them accessible for kids, I think is is the best. It's just the best. Yeah. Um. Before before we we let you go, the, one, <laughs> the other thing we like to ask all of our guests is what is the the weirdest or your favorite piece in your collection like what's what's what fills that uh that category or both it is it will check off both of those marks in one answer all right so uh, uh maybe three or four years ago i acquired uh unpainted unassembled Storm Shadow Polish bootleg that was not on the card back or anything. So it's, I mean, I have a Polish card as well that's not used. It's like a mint card. I had two of them actually. But I, so I collect Polish bootlegs and this is like a Storm Shadow Polish bootleg that's not assembled. So it's still like on the sprue and it's not painted. And I sent that to, uh, not AFA, but the other one, uh, CGA, or no, that's comics. But uh, what's that other collector grading? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the great, uh, I can't think of the acronym right now. No, uh, me neither. Um, you know who I mean, though. Yes, that's yeah. you mean, though. Yeah. Sorry, guys, for not it's shouting been, you out. But, it's been a long week. But yeah, yeah. Um, so I have it graded, and it's, like I said, next to like an unused card. And I think it's like a one of one. Like, I don't think that's like something that other people have. <laughs> so it's like a, it's like a, yeah. A, it's like the version two Storm Shadow from 88. But it's a Polish bootleg of him. That's unpainted, unassembled. 85, like a U85 grade or 90 or something. <laughs> In this big display case where he's like all set up, like unassembled, you know, and like how that company what the fuck are they called? Collector's Archive. Uh, Collector's Archive something. <laughs> but they do that. They started doing it first with like the pegs and kind of like how they would uh, display the weapons and stuff instead of how AFA did just taping them on the inside like they used to. And now AFA Col- kind of copied them. Collector's Archive Services. Yeah, so C- C- CAS. 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 Yes, yes, yes. CAS. So CAS, I sent it to them, and they do such a good job with their display pieces that I uh, I sent it to them, and they have all the weapons, you know, displayed in the, the way that they do, where they're, like, kind of uh, vacuum-formed, kind of into a spot, and the figure's, like, all broken apart with his head, his body, his two arms, his legs, like, all spread out. It's very nice piece, very nice. And it's, like, a one-of-one one of my favorite pieces it's in my living room and uh yeah somebody's gonna have to pry that out of my cold dead hands <laughs> <laughs> that that definitely does check both of those boxes at once yeah sure weird Congrat- cool Congratulations. <laughs> yeah rare yeah that and i have like a uh this so it'd be like the second card from return of the jedi is like the desert scene of boba fett graded afa graded but it's a 60 but i think i should have it regraded because it's literally like perfect and the only thing that's wrong with it is a hanger tear that isn't even noticeable from the front you can only see that the hanger tear is from the back because when they put it in the case they like laid it perfect on top of where it ripped and it's underneath that flap that holds the the card straight at the top of the case. Oh, I got so it. So it looks like a mint, mint 
AFA graded Boba Fett, Return of the Jedi Fett, but it's a it got a sixty, and it's like an eighty five figure, eighty card. The bubbles perfectly clear. Everything's perfect about it, but that hanger tear. And I, I, I feel like he got somebody on a bad day or something. Yeah, <laughs> I've talked. I've talked to the guys at AFA at like San Diego Comic Con and gone by the booth with pictures of it, and they're like, "Yeah, send it in." You, you, the worst that you'll get is the same grade. But to me, I don't know if the grade matters. It was just the opportunity to get one that was perfect. Like I didn't think I would ever be able to get one like that. And I got this maybe 15 years ago. So I think I got it for like $600 or maybe $700. But it was at the time I kind of convinced my wife, like this is a once in a lifetime thing where I'll never be able to find another one that's like this clean for such a cheap price that looks so good. Like, and the only thing that has against it is this hanger tear and kind of a shitty grade, you know? But so that's my other like prized piece, I guess. And then all my, I kept like the paint masters of all my handmade figures. Uh, so that'd be like the first piece that I cast it out of the mold and assembled and painted. And then all my other, like the whole edition I made, whether it be 25, 50, a hundred, two, three, 400, some figures I made most, so many editions of, but I would uh, copy, I would be copying that first one that I did. And I, I have all those too. That's gotta be awesome. That's I, awesome. I, I think I did. Didn't you not too long ago, weren't you going through some of those original ones? And yeah. Jettisoning some of yeah, them? Yeah. I got rid of some of like, I've so in the last year, I kind of dedicated my life, I suppose, to Phantom, my like Phantom Star Killer IP and like my original IP, I suppose, like my own shit, and not making any more like pop culture uh, figures. Cause I, I mean, that there's, it's just like if my own creations are getting me where I want to go, I don't think I need to focus on other people's creations anymore. So I kind of made that decision um, like late 2019. And so that's kind of when I decided, like I started kind of cleaning house of some of the things that, you know, I I don't, I mean, yes, they have some kind of value, um, not value, but like um, sentimental value to me that I made this thing years ago. And, you know, but there's guys who, have these great collections of my stuff and to have something like that would be like, I was just describing these crazy things I collect and I like, and I want to me, it's my, you'd have to pry it out of my cold dead hands to somebody else. That thing that I'm just walking past every day, that's collecting dust that I made seven years ago, that might've like been the first thing that they saw that introduced him to this weird, wacky world of bootleg figures. And then they started collecting things and then they started making things. Then they met, met, met a friend. And now there's some guy that they've been talking to online is their best friend. And it all started because this fucking Franken fett figure I made. And they happened to see on Facebook because some group in Thailand posted it on a Facebook group. And now he's got the chance to buy that figure. Like to me, that, that means more that he has it than I do, you know? And it, it does get crazy like that. Kind of, I mean, I wasn't, that's like a real example. I wasn't just making that up, but that's true. Yeah. So, I mean, it's kind of wild how this art scene has inspired so many and made so many lifelong friendships for people. And the, the, you know, the kind of the, the, how far it's taken me to where this is, you know, um, been my job for the last 10 years, almost that I've been doing this pursuing my art full time and uh you know so i i you know i don't know i it's it's all very moving and touching you know and i think it's 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 uh, a good thing that people are doing this and that you know i'm happy that i started doing it and it all uh happened from collecting toys well even you know people who now make toys because of you you know like that's that's another kind of awesome kind of thing to think about yeah it goes it's pretty wild because there's like generations of guys that have 
started making toy or that that have been toy makers i i would be like considered like a first generation guy and then there's guys that i inspired that started making toys that are no longer doing it that inspired guys that inspired guys and it goes i don't even know you'd have to talk to somebody like dove from dke toys who is kind of maybe a like more of a historian i suppose on the resin bootleg game but it it's you know there's guys that are st- that their first figures at at new york comic-con they're not their first one but they have their first release at dove's booth at dke con this weekend that you know uh you know maybe some guy that started five years after me that was inspired by four guys before me that 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 all inspired each other like it's so wild how it's just kind of grown into this worldwide art scene you know so um just before we wrap things up um where can we find you on the internet and um is there anything that you'd like to plug go go for it um so yeah you can find me at killer bootlegs on instagram or twitter or facebook or phantom star killer on instagram or you know phantomstarkiller.com or killerbootlegs.com i got some new thing i'm doing every week multiple things so i'm just as long as you're following those accounts and you know i'll be posting and sharing and all the progress that that goes on with all these cool projects i'm working on and we'll of course be doing uh our due diligence to to share uh everything that we see you know on a, on our you know on our feed we you know we have nothing but the utmost of respect for for you what you're doing you know it's it really is art and and we love it you know we're we're inspired by it and uh you know we we can't wait to see what's coming next so uh peter thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh it has been a hell of a weekend for you and uh get some rest (laughs) yeah thanks for having me guys i've i've been following you guys and i love what you guys are doing and uh i'm happy to be a part and anytime you guys want me to come back and talk about any of this goofy stuff that i that goes on i'm happy to more than happy we're we're we live for the goofy shit man we yeah, live for it me too it's, <laughs> it's I, the best i it's definitely like a weird movie that i don't understand what's going on sometimes <laughs> i'm like walking in halfway through it you know and it's in french and i'm just enjoying <laughs> the ride you know enjoying the ride that's that's a good way to send it off Thank you, dear listener, for hanging out with us today. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you listen, and then tell your friends to do it. Thanks also to Joe Azari, the golden voice behind our intro. Our music is Game Boy Horror by the Zombie Dandies. Find more about them both on our show notes. Follow us on social media at AIC underscore podcast on Instagram and Twitter. Stop by and say hi. Show us your toy hauls and share your toy stories. Maybe we'll talk about it in a future episode. Don't try this at home. Voidware prohibited and some assembly required. Each sold separately, not a flying toy. Consult a physician if your toy run exceeds more than four hours. This has been a non-productive media presentation. Executive producer, Frank Hablawi. This program and many others like it on the Non-Productive Network is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Please share it, but ask before trying to change it or sell it. For more information, visit non-productive.com. 